Hi there, welcome to this video. Thanks for clicking on and watching. Hopefully you've done so because you're sitting maths at Excel A level this summer and paper two is Tuesday the 14th of June. So just going to go through some last minute pointers um, talking about the advanced information and wanting to wish you all the very best for the exam on Tuesday. So here we have the advanced information for the first few lines of the topics that are included in paper two. Formal proof you did have for both the advanced information and on paper one, I've got it in front of me here, you had proof by contradiction, you had the PQ with at least one of them being even, you had to prove by contradiction and you had an algebraic proof by deduction. So you've had those on paper one, so maybe tomorrow you might have proof by exhaustion or proof by counterexample. You don't know, you might have contradiction or deduction again but um, I would definitely look at some examples on exhaustion and counterexample. The modulus function, do you definitely understand um, when we take the mod after we've applied the function then this is going to be the type of graph where we can't let the y value go negative. So these are the type of graphs that when we get to the graph maybe going underneath, it is reflected and sits on the x-axis as opposed to when you take the mod before you apply the function. Well, x being positive here is not affected by the mod lines. So you can have a graph that maybe comes down and it is negative. But as soon as it gets to the y-axis, then the negative values of x can go into the function. But because of the mod lines, they are read as positive values. So you just get a reflection in the y-axis. So definitely know the difference between the two of those. Um, function notation. So if we have f such that x maps onto and then whatever we're doing in our function and then maybe x is bigger than zero and x belongs to the reals. This notation here at the front is just the same as f of x. Um, this bit here, part of the function, is, is the domain of the function. So that's telling you what values of x can be inputted. When we're looking at the range, that is the output. Now, when you're looking at inverse functions, um, to find inverse functions, if you just let the given function equal y, make x the subject and then swap y for x because Inverse functions are functions themselves and all input values are x. So that's how to get the inverse function. If we had a simple function, say we had y equals 2x, then the inverse function would be y equals half x. And all inverse functions are a reflection in the line y equals x. Now, there's four types of mapping. You can have one to one, many to one one to many or many to many. Only two of them are functions. One to one and many to one are functions. So an example of a one to one would be maybe a straight line and an example of a many to one would be a quadratic. Now, how do we test to see whether we've got a function? If you think about the graph of the function, if you do a vertical line test all the way along, then a function only goes through the vertical line um, once. And so both of those are functions. If you do have a function, so you have one of these, one to one or many to one, then you can do a horizontal line test. If it is one to one, it just goes through once. If you do a horizontal line, if it's many to one, it goes through twice. Now, when you think about inverse functions, if we have a many to one and we do the inverse function, that will then be uh, one to many. So many to one functions do not have inverses. Only one to ones have inverses. Only one to one have an inverse. So sometimes a part C or D in the question might be why can't this function have an inverse? It's because we have to restrict the domain uh, and only one to one functions can have inverses. Now the other thing to think about is if we're 
given the domain, so say the domain was uh, x bigger than 0 for this particular function here, then if we wanted to find the range of the inverse, then that you would just swap it round. So because the domain is bigger than 0, the range for the inverse is bigger than 0. But you still have to put it as the range, which is y values, and then the x is the domain. So when you have inverse functions, the domain of one becomes the range of the inverse and vice versa. The domain of the inverse becomes the range of the function. So sometimes you get asked to write down and you just have to think about that, that opposite uh, thing going on. Uh, binomial expansion, I'll talk about it in a minute. Sequences generated by an iterative formula. Um, well, that could just be uh, x uh, n plus 1 is equal to x n, maybe 3 x n squared minus 4. So it's whatever you do to um, the previous term will get you to the next term along. Um, geometric sequences and series, trigonometric identities. I have made a video where I found two questions in particular that had trig identities in the geometric series. So do be sure to check um, those out because there aren't very many examples of that type of question in the topic tests. So just having a little look at what you get on the formula sheet. Um, tomorrow you're going to be doing a geometric series. You get the sum to n terms. A is your first term, R is your common ratio, and N is the amount of terms. If a series converges, then R has to be between minus 1 and 1. That's your common ratio. And then this is the formula you use to find the sum to infinity if that series converges. Um, binomial series, you get two versions of it in the formula sheet. Um, if n is a negative number or a fraction or both, then you must use this version of it, the second one. Um, so if we had 2 plus x to the minus 3 or whatever, then you are going to have to use this version, but you must get that 1 in the front. So you'll have to take the 2 out and then you'll have 1 plus x over 2 so that that 2 divides in but then you must still raise all of that to the minus 3 so that 2 on the front must be to that power the, the power n if you don't have um, a negative value or a fraction, then you have a number that's uh, not one in the front. You can use this version, the, the top one. Um, just remember that um, the NCR is N2 is NC2 and the 2 there has to be the same power on the B and when you have the two powers on A and B they must sum to the N. You do need to know what your calculator is doing. I've seen on an old C2 paper you had um, 40 CR is equal to uh, 40 factorial over 36 factorial um, n factorial what is n and n is equal to 4. The two numbers on the bottom have to complement to the number on the top. Um, so there are all the things you might have to use this one. e to the x ln of a just equals a to the x. So that works e to the ln of a to the x taking that x up. And then these two are the inverse of each other. So that is just a to the x. So just looking at the other topics on the advanced information, use of a trigonometric function, that could be in a modeling question. Uh, the function of a to the x, I have done a separate video on how to integrate, differentiate, and looking at the graph of a to the x. So have a little uh, look at that if you want. Differentiation and roots of equations. When you're differentiating and equating it to zero, you're finding stationary points. If you are seeing where things um, intersect and you maybe take everything to one side and then look at the roots when you've got it equal to zero roots of equations you can look at the discriminant b squared minus 4ac if it's bigger than zero you have got um, two roots and this is just obviously for a quadratic if b squared minus 4ac is equal to zero you've got one root and if b squared minus 4ac is less than zero, you have got um, no roots. 
Um, differentiation from first principles, you do get a start on that on the formula sheet, but just remember to always put your limb on each line as h tends towards zero. Uh, the newton raphson formula get in the formula sheet. Differentiation of curves defined parametrically. There's plenty of examples to go and look on, on that and practice those. Area under curve, you could have, um, you know, two curves and they are trapped between and you have to integrate top curve minus bottom. Um, you could have um, just a curve and then simply a straight line and then you would just find the area of the rectangle. You would integrate between the two points and find the area under the curve and then if you wanted the area trapped between them just do the rectangle minus the area under the curve. You could have a function where the area comes below and then goes above so you'd have to integrate between the two points and the integration for the bit below would be negative so you just would ignore the negative and then do the integration of the positive bit and then find that and then add those two areas together so when it goes underneath and above you have to separate it um, that's areas under curves solutions of first order differential equation partial fractions just have a look at the different types of partial fractions you can have have linear denominators, repeated factors, um, and then you can have the top heavy. And then how do we solve a differential equation? You have to separate the variables and integrate. You get the trapezium rule in the formula sheet. Um, so they're usually OK to use, but I'll talk about them a little bit in a minute. Um, vectors, you had that shape in paper one with the rhombus where people had forgotten that the diagonals of a rhombus cross at right angles. But you had a shape in uh, paper one. So maybe you might have vectors being um, used to represent a force or some velocity. You've got to solve that type of question or you might have a triangle or, or who knows. But there's plenty of examples to look at vectors um, being used to solve pure maths problems. So here is the bits and pieces you get for differentiation and integration. Uh, from first principles, you do get this first line. So whenever you're doing your first principles, look at that to make sure you're starting your first principles questions with that. You get all these functions and how to differentiate them. You get the quotient rule, which is uh, bottom diff top minus top diff bottom all over bottom squared. You don't get the product rule, which is first differential of second plus second differential of first. Integration, and we can use this section of the formula sheet because integrating going that way, but of course differentiation will go that way. So remember to use them for, for both ways and same vice versa with the differentiation. Uh, you get the integration by parts formula, but there was an integration by parts question on paper one. So whether you'll be asked to do that again. I think they might ask you integration by substitution or inspection or um, you know reverse chain rule or whatever, or maybe one of these trying to prove one of these um, that you get in the formula book. But you might get an integration by parts again, you don't know. So here's all the trig identities. So be sure to know how to use these to get your double angle formulae. Um, you just have to say that A and B are the same. The small angle approximations, have a look at questions on them because in the topic test there were quite a few examples with the small angle approximations and uh, I don't think there was any of them in paper one. So just remember that you have to have theta being measured in radians. So here's the two formula get in numerical methods on the formula sheet. This is how they appear. The trapezium rule, um, if you're trying to approximate um, the area under a curve between A and B, and you have, say, four strips, all the strips need to be the same width. So they all need to be H. Um, you are going to go between A and B. If you can't decide what H is, then you can just do B minus A divided by the number of strips that you need, which is N. Um, you could be asked, is your estimate an overestimate or an underestimate? So you can see if we drew 
the trapezium on the top because this curve dips underneath our approximation would be an overestimate you might be asked to find the percentage error if you're asked to do a trapezium rule and then do an actual integration and compare the two then it's going to be the difference between the two divided by the actual and then times it by a hundred uh, Newton Raphson's for iteration just look at the formula you need to do uh, the next approximation for the root is going to be the previous one minus f of the previous one divided by the differential of it so just a quick video with some last minute pointers and things to think about before you go and do that exam tomorrow so hopefully you found that helpful do like and subscribe and check out my other videos if you have um have a strategy before you go into that exam are you going to just do each question as it comes as you turn over or are you going to maybe do questions one and two because they are usually not worth as many marks get your brain warmed up and then have a little look later on to see whether you like the look of a question that's later on and, and, and just do that trying to keep yourself positive try not to worry if things aren't dropping out if you've got to show that question you just can't quite get get the answer in, in the time do not be drawn in to just um, carry on pursuing that answer because if it's not coming out ju just leave it alone because you're on uh, a timer against the clock and you know you are losing valuable time there will be other marks on that exam that you can go and get and that is your job tomorrow to maximize the amount of marks that you can get in that two hours okay best of luck everybody um i will see you uh, when we have a look at some more applied questions for next week for the final exam so i'll see you on the next one